Let's talk more about ApoB, apolipoprotein B, and why it's important and why you should always request this on your next set of labs. When you go to your doctor or get your annual physical, you need to look at your ApoB to A1 ratio. I will explain all the significance here and what this means, but I want to lean on this paper. This was a really good paper from the so-called the Swedish Amoris cohort study, which is the apolipoprotein mortality risk cohort involving 130 some odd thousand uh, subjects that were tracked for years. And what they found is that there was a strong correlation between the ApoB to ApoA1 ratio and risk of major adverse cardiovascular events, or so-called MACEs. You might see this acronym floating around in various videos or when you go into PubMed and look at LDL cholesterol and, and myocardial infarction or having a heart attack and what have you. But you may remember, it was about a year ago, we talked about this specific cohort that has been tracked, as I mentioned, for the better part of 20 years, 130,000 uh, some odd subjects. And what was unique about this cohort in Sweden is that they tracked individuals that were over the age of 65, and then some study subjects had lived all the way to 100 years of age. And I bring this up because what they found is that higher LDL cholesterol at age 65 was linked with greater odds of becoming a centenarian. So we've talked about this cohort before. They also found inverse associations with blood glucose levels, uh, liver enzymes, hemoglobin A1C, and other biomarkers at age 65 inversely correlated with the odds of reaching 100 years of age. So I bring that up because it, it seems that metabolic health is really important when it comes to uh, living a long, healthy life. And Again, we hear so much about LDL cholesterol that it's causally linked with the development of atherosclerotic plaque and is correlated with major adverse cardiovascular events, but we don't hear so much about HDL and how protective HDL is. And so I think it's really important when considering the, your risk of developing future cardiovascular disease, you look at LDL in context of HDL. And so I really work with my clients about this a lot and, and emphasizing this because oftentimes they'll come with a lipid panel They'll have LDL, they'll have total cholesterol, they'll have HDL, and they'll have triglycerides. But we really don't know, especially if they are already a little bit insulin resistant, uh, what the lipids in context really mean. And, and so as you likely know, individuals who are on the path of developing insulin resistance, the association with LDL cholesterol and the significance of that gets a little bit more blurry, a little bit more obtuse. And that's why I recommend looking at the ApoB to A1 ratio, because these are direct measurements of both your ApoB containing lipoproteins, which include VLDL and LDL and remnant lipoprotein in the ratio or rel relative abundance to your HDL, because it turns out that all of your atherogenic lipoproteins have one and only one apolipoprotein B particle on them. So when we measure ApoB, we're getting a direct assessment of the atherogenic lipoproteins in the ratio of HDL, because it turns out that most of the atherogenic lipoproteins that come in contact with your vessel wall just go away and go back out. And part of how that reverse cholesterol transport happens is mediated by HDL. And so we want to look at the ratio. And, and the punchline here, if you're busy, is that you really want an ApoB to A1 of around 0.5. Okay. So you know, there's a lot of people that have really high ApoB, but they also have really high ApoA1. And so that ratio is closer to like 0.5 or 0.6, in which case they are low risk. And that is exactly what this long, longitudinal cohort study found using data from 135 some odd thousand study subjects as part of the Swedish Amoris cohort, finding that the ratio of ApoB to A1 actually does in fact predict major adverse cardiovascular event risk over the long, a long period of time. So I just want to pause and say thank you all for being here. Hopefully you're enjoying this content. Hit that like button if you are. Now, since we're talking about metabolic health, I want to remind you about a natural tool known as berberine. You've heard me talk about berberine. What's unique about berberine is it's one of the only effective natural products that supports metabolic health that you can actually test for and feel. That's why over at Mao Science, there's over 330 some odd reviews on berberine. I recommend taking two to three capsules about 30 minutes before major meals, usually dinner time, because it can possibly help with curbing food cravings in the evening. But there's tons of research on berberine, my friends. Again, there's so many supplements out there, citrus bergamot, and there's grapeseed extract and all of this. But berberine is one of the only tools that I generally recommend because you can test for this. It's effective. There's lots of research on this, and we are sourcing over at Myoscience is sourcing a, a hand harvested Himalayan berberine extract that actually works. And there's clinical studies supporting the effectiveness of this. So you can go to Myoscience and save with the code podcast at checkout on the berberine fasting accelerator. So getting back to the study, this is really interesting stuff. First of all, let's talk about why the study was done. 
The international guidelines for treatment of high cholesterol recommend monitoring atherogenic low-density lipoprotein and non-HDL lipoprotein levels via ApoB. Now, you might be saying, well, gosh, why aren't more doctors in the U.S. doing this? I really don't know. I've worked with hundreds, if not thousands of people in the last several years, and I find that very few people actually have ApoB on their, on their blood work. When they go, whether they're in the military, they go to the VA, or they're part of Kaiser, or these big HMOs, the doctors aren't looking at ApoB. Let's make, let's normalize this. I mean, we should be, it's, last time I checked, it was a, a $17 test. It used to be $11 and increased to 14 now it's 17 bucks. I mean, I think mean, we can all afford this. But they say that in this long-term observational study, the Swedish study, we measured the association of ApoB and ApoA1 with development of major adverse cardiovascular events. We wanted to see at the risk of having a major adverse cardiovascular event was associated to both ApoB or A1 or the ApoB to A1 ratio. Here's what they say. We linked ApoB and A1 laboratory analysis to clinical registers to investigate the association with risk of new major adverse cardiovascular events. Men and women of all ages were followed for decades and 22,000 people had a major adverse cardiovascular event. That's 22,000 out of like 135 some odd thousand people. They say, we discovered that the low protective levels of ApoA1 were associated with increased levels of ApoB and higher risk of MACE, major, major adverse cardiovascular events. In addition, a high ApoB to A1 ratio was strongly associated with the risk of having a major adverse cardiovascular event. In persons who had a major adverse cardiovascular event, the ApoB to A1 ratio was elevated already two decades before the event. Now, you might be saying, well, what are the cut points? What is a high ApoA1? Well, here's the cut points. Really, the ratio that you're looking for and this is really important for those of you that are lean mass hyperresponder, where your ApoB is off the charts, make sure you look at your ApoA1 because oftentimes when you are metabolically healthy, your LDL will go up, but so will your HDL. And so it's more of that ratio that I think is important. So the, the cut points here are between 0.2 and 0.6. As I mentioned, most people that I've worked with who are exercising, eating a whole food omnivorous style diet, their ApoB to A1 ratio is 0.5. Okay. Um, now, the absolute numbers, in my opinion, are not as important as the relative numbers. What do I mean by that? So if your ApoB is really high, as long as your ApoA1 is also high, it's the relative ratio. Because as I mentioned, various studies find about 80% of the atherogenic lipoproteins, they go into the, the vessel wall, the endothelial tissue, and they leave just fine. How are they leaving? They're, how, they're not all getting stuck in there and modified and creating the foam cell and the fatty streak and the plaque they're leaving the vessel wall by way of HDL. So it's that relative proportion. And so that's, you can Google the lean mass hyperresponder phenotype and look more into that. But these are the cut points. So the people that had really high ratios of ApoB to A1, meaning the ApoB is really high, but the ApoA1, the relative proportions of LDL to HDL is skewed. And so it could be that in those metabolically unhealthy people, the atherogenic lipoproteins, the remnant lipoproteins, the LDL is dumping a lot of, it's becoming modified in the vessel wall, dumping a lot of cholesterol, contributing to the process of atherosclerosis that as you can see from this hazard ratio, the people with the highest levels of ApoB and low levels of ApoA1 uh, tended to have, you know, a orders of magnitude higher risk of having a major adverse cardiovascular event. So I think that is, is really interesting and, and specifically a heart attack. And this is what the second figure here uh, shows. So again, we wanna look at the ratio. You know, so it's important. I, I have seen recently more and more clients getting ApoB on their labs, which is great, but guess what? They're missing ApoA1. So it's like, we don't have the context there. We don't really know. It's like silly analogy, but we think of like, cops and robbers, right? If you have a lot of robbers in the streets and a lot of crime, well, that's problematic, right? But if you have a lot of cops on the streets that can prevent some of these uh, criminals from engaging in criminality, uh, there's not going to be much of a net negative on society and, and crime and assaults and robberies and things like that. So look at it that way. I'm sure there's a bunch of other better analogies, but I think the bottom line here is the ratio is really important. And so what does the abnormal ApoB to A1 ratio look like? Uh, 0.9 up to 5. Again, meaning that when your ApoB to A1 ratio come closer to 1, 1 to 1, that's more problematic. So what do you do if you have a high LDL? Okay. How can you increase your ApoA1 with exercise? 
with metabolic health. So um, people who strength train, who do cardio, who are physically active, getting 10, 12,000 steps per day, naturally that increases your HDL and that will increase your ApoA1. And so even if your cholesterol is naturally high, you can decrease the, the differential there and, and increase the relative proportion of your HDL it, it, to ApoB. And in theory, that could reduce your risk of a long-term major adverse cardiovascular event. So I think that's really important. There's a lot of interesting research coming out, uh, finding that the the risk of, of having a high ApoB is, is not insignificant, but if the ratio is there, meaning that if you have a high ApoA1 uh, along with a high ApoB, that your risk is uh, of having a major adverse cardiovascular event is much lower. So in summary, we could dive into all the weeds on the functionality of this and so on. It's really simple. Test your ApoB to A1 ratio next time you get your labs. Um, I recommend starting with our blood work cheat sheet. You can download that in the description below and just recommend your doctor do this. And if your doctor won't do it for you, then just find another doctor who will. I know a lot of um, you know, folks at Kaiser and these HMOs and so forth, they only have a subset of panels. They're always worried about cost cutting and so on. Just go and pay some cash for this. You can pay $150 and get a Chem 24 with a CBC and differential and look at your ApoB A1 ratio as an add-on uh, along with LP little a and fibrinogen. And that gives you a really good idea about your uh, long-term risk of future cardiovascular disease. Um, so that's what I suggest, my friends. Uh, this is a really interesting study, and there's many other studies to show this. Now, you might be saying, well, you know, Mike, I don't have uh, the money for this. I, I don't have the time, but I do have my tri triglyceride levels. Well, it turns out that your blood triglyceride to HDL ratio uh, is very similar. You know, that, that ratio, you'd want it, you know, closer to one uh, or even a lower triglyceride level and higher HDL. And so, but it, it turns out that ApoB to A1 correlates pretty tightly with triglyceride to HDL ratios. And so this is one thing that I see in clients all the time is pretty high triglycerides and low HDL, which is not what you want. You want low triglycerides and higher HDL. You know, just had a client the other day, blood triglycerides were 45 milligrams per deciliter and his HDL was 70 milligrams per deciliter. And so that was phenomenal. And so I can tell just by looking at this person's labs, you know, that they exercise, they eat well, then I interviewed them and we, we did it back and forth. They do a lot of uh, hiking, a lot of cross-country skiing, weightlifting, uh, you know, shop at farmer's markets and go to a local butcher. And you can see in their labs that they're metabolically healthy. So in that uh, case, I didn't recommend running out and getting labs, running out and looking at the ApoB to A1. We have a pretty good idea from the triglyceride to HDL ratio, but especially for those of you who are on the trajectory of insulin resistance and, and starting to lose some weight and things like that. Um, I think it's important to look at your ApoB to A1. So we have pretty good evidence here. You want it closer to 0.5, that ratio. So let me know what you think in the comment section below, my friends. I appreciate you tuning all the way through. We'll catch you on a future video down the road.